David Wallace with PV Reporter, and we're here uh, for Ash 2019 in Orlando, Florida. And today we're interviewing with Dr. JJ Kalajian from Paris, France, and we're very thankful to have you again this year, Dr. Kalajian. Thank you, David. Yes. Um, so the first thing I wanted to discuss was um, a rope peg interferon. So the thrombotic risk reduction and high rate of complete molecular response with long-term use of ROPEG interferon in PV. So tell us about your findings of this study. So during this meeting, we present the long-term results of the so-called proud and continuation PV studies mm -hmm. uh, after four years of use in both arms of treatment. Do you remember that this uh, randomized study compared head-to-head -head hydroxyurea to this new form of interferon, ROPEG interferon alpha-2b, which is a very long-acting interferon uh, with an injection every two weeks. And uh, we, we show here the results after four years in, in the, of treatment in both arms. And I would say that maybe like a good French wine, you know, yeah. it improves over time. So what we show here is that first, in terms of complete hematologic response, 61% of patients in the ROPEG arm maintain the complete response over four year, at the fourth year of treatment compared to only 43% in the hydroxyurea arm. In addition, the use of the drug was very easy because we noticed that 40, more than 40% of patients during the fourth year require just one injection per month. So very easy treatment compared to uh, everyday uh, pills or, or even uh, weekly administration of the current forms of pregnancy. The second reassuring point was that we observed a very low rate of thrombotic events in both arms of treatment, in fact, and probably because it, we chose an early PV population, but still we had uh, around 3% uh, thrombotic events in both arms of treatment, so it was very nice. The second important point, of course, is the molecular response. So the diminution of the JAK2 mutant alien burden. And at four years of treatment, we had 65, more than 65% in the interferon arm who achieved some reduction in the JAK2 alien burden compared to only 25% in the hydroxyurea arm. Importantly, the median value of the JAK2, the quantity of JAK2 mutation, that was around 40% in both groups at the beginning of the study, right. regularly decreased in the interferon arm down to less than 10% at the fourth year, mm -hmm. while in the hydroxyurea arm, it remained, it remained almost the same and slightly increased to reach a 45% median alien burden at four years, so a huge difference between the two groups of treatment. In addition, we have now a proportion of patients who could achieve so-called complete molecular response, meaning that the JAK2 mutation is no longer detectable with the usual tests. And we have uh, 13 patients in the interferon arm who achieve this complete molecular response, 11 of which also have complete hematological response, so normal counts, JAK2 is no longer detectable, and no patient in the hydroxyurea arm, unfortunately, could have this complete molecular response. So again, a big difference between the two drugs in terms of potential disease modification on the long term, because once you achieve complete hematological response with normal counts, complete molecular response, your JAK2 mutation is gone. Right. So this probably opens the way to see if we can stop treatment in these patients and see what happens. We have this experience with the other forms of interferon, but here we have a substantial proportion of patients who may achieve this, uh, maybe not cure, but what we call sometimes operational cure, okay. that uh, meaning that they could be completely treatment-free with normal counts, no, of course, no symptoms, and no job communication. Okay, well, that's impressive results, and I remember uh, I think we interviewed a couple years ago and uh, talked about the early stage of ROPEG versus uh, hydroxyurea. In one year, it wasn't a tremendous difference, but you know we know that the ROPEG is slow acting. So this is great news for all patients, I think. Yes, exactly. I think you're right. The two drugs have different profile. They are both useful, I think. We do not throw away, of course, hydroxyurea because yes. the the 
the rapidity of action is, is important. You quickly reach responses. You are protected from vascular events. Uh, so it's also useful. But we have now this balance between the two drugs with different objectives on the long term, of course. And as you know, PV is not an acute disease, hopefully. So we have to deal it with for, for a long time, for many years. And if we can reduce the burden of treatment and sometimes stop treatment for patients, it would be great. Okay, all right, very good. Um, if I were a patient uh, just starting out on ROPEG, uh, what would the in initial dose be and what would be the uh, incremental uh, increases for dose adjustment? And then also, what would be like the median um, dose that, that a patient on average uh, might use? Well, this is an important question that is not completely solved by the, the clinical trial because when we started the, the, the study, we were very cautious to avoid adverse events, so we start at very low dose. So it took a while to increase progressively the dose to achieve the, the, the efficient dose that is probably somewhere around 250, 400 micrograms every two weeks. But what we noticed is that, uh, again, with the long-term use, we saw a decrease in the average dose uh, every year. So going down from 600 micrograms to less than 400 micrograms at the fourth year. Mm -hmm. So showing again that you can probably start maybe with a high dose and after one or two years of treatment, start to decrease the dose, taper the dose, and hopefully maybe stop someday. Okay, all right, well, that's, that's good to hear. Um, so, uh, do you uh, foresee any combination studies with ROPEG? Are there any going on, or is that a future possibility? Tell me your feelings on that. Uh, in polycytemia vera, I don't think so, because we have two, at least two efficient drugs mm -hmm. that can be complementary. If you don't care with one, you can switch to the other, etc. And we have nice results with both, different, but uh, quite interesting. So. I don't think a combination should be tested unless for few patients who unfortunately are resistant to everything or have very aggressive disease, very proliferative disease, so maybe a small subset of patients. But probably this more would be important for patients with myelofibrosis or advanced stage of, of PV, uh, like the patients who were tested, for example, in the Ruxolitinib trial, the response study that had very advanced stage with a big spleen, you know, already a huge amount of phlebotomy uh, and very proliferative diseases. So maybe, yes, we have to find a, a partner for uh, ROPEG interferon. As you know, probably we have an ongoing study in myelofibrosis combining interferon and ruxolitinib mm -hmm. that shows interesting results on the first uh, part of the study. Now we are expanding to more patients, but we found nice molecular responses and not only on JAK2 but also you know that some patients have additional mutations right. that sometimes have bad mutations that mm -hmm. induce a poor prognosis so we were pleased to see that we could reduce not only JAK2 mutation but also these additional mutations in some patients combining both drugs so yes we have still to find partners okay all right and that leads me into my next question so uh, with Pegasus, um, we've seen good results uh, showing hematological and molecular remission. Um, as a patient that's on Pegasus and doing well, uh, is there any benefit to switching to ROPEG or would you just keep the patient on the same medication? That's an important practical question because a lot of patients put the from that currently are on Pegasus. Mm -hmm. uh, Obviously, for Europe, at least since the drug is now approved, the ROPEG is approved uh, for PV, so it would be natural to switch to this drug because you know, of, of regulatory reasons. Yeah. Uh, uh, otherwise, I don't know if, if the patient is well on, on Pegasus, is there a benefit to switch? I think the only possibility probably would be to achieve better molecular response and, and stop treatment. Mm -hmm. So if the patient on Pegasus still has a high amount of JAK2 mutation, maybe it would be nice to try the other one. Okay. Uh, and also the mode of administration is also 
easier. Right. Uh, we would have you know pens that can uh, do for self injection and doing one injection per month yeah. instead of weekly is also maybe an advantage for the patients. Yes, and, and I can see that um, as a patient who takes Pegasus uh, mm -hmm. uh, infrequently, but um, at one point I was taking it every week. Mm -hmm. and to, to be able to push to once a month is mm -hmm. a big deal. Uh, yeah. You know, I think for patients. Well, um, I'd like to thank you for uh, talking with me uh, again this year and uh, look forward to uh, your studies in the future. You're always one of the world experts that I like to keep an eye on. Thank you very much, David. Okay, thank you. Thank you.